let's start off with some intros. Um, and Bree, we can start with you. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm Bree. I work at Lyft as a social media manager, managing and wrangling the content calendar, doing agency stuff, doing influencer stuff, doing TikTok stuff. Um, I've been here almost eight months at Lyft. And then previously, I was at Adobe where I launched our brand TikTok channel. Also did a lot of content calendar wrangling, influencer stuff, event stuff, community management. Um, super excited to be here. My favorite flavor of ice cream is birthday cake as well. I don't know if you asked that, Zach. It's a very important question to me. So okay. I just want to throw that out there. Okay. Birthday cake. Yes. Quite an interesting flavor. <laughs> uh, I like it. I like it. Now we're going to have to come prepared. Uh, for me, though, I feel like you like just rolled over the fact that you helped build out Adobe's TikTok. What did you What did you end up building that to at your time at Adobe? Right before I left, we were just under 300K. Uh, we were a little, late, a little late in the game, but okay. you know, better late than never. So, nice. yeah, it was a wild ride wild ride yeah but it's doing great it's doing great sweet well morgan you're up wow all right well Bree's over here killing it so uh i'm morgan started off as a sales development rep so an sdr cold calling etc during my time as an sdr i created a lot of content started something called the sdr chronicles to get my content journey going uh and eventually became a sales trainer through that so i trained zoom slack google salesforce any big name company i've gone and trained them on how to do prospecting. And now I focus on the content creation side, more so helping companies on their B2B influencer marketing. Uh, so excited to talk about that here today. Then my favorite ice cream is strawberry, but apparently that's sus. I don't know why, <laughs> but, but, but hey, look, totally. strawberry is the best. It wasn't, sus. It, it wasn't sus until you told us that it's with the frozen chunks in it. Look, if you go to the right spot and they have, it's, it's on point. Now they could be bad at some places and then it's like, I don't want it. But some places it's like, they just do it perfectly. I think I just like, don't try enough strawberry ice cream with the chunks in it to be like a uh, connoisseur. Like, <laughs> you know, like, You're not a big I'm going to have an expert in this. All right. Okay. Hey, I, I believe that. So LinkedIn influencer, content creator, strawberry ice cream expert. That should be that's it. the following. The new the line. I love that. Um, also, guys, if you're watching, we would love you to drop your own ice cream flavors in there. Um, it will actually determine if we connect with you after the call, like depending on if you <laughs> like your ice cream flavor. Uh, but my name is Zach. Uh, I'm working at Ubiquitous right now, uh, running campaigns for fun brands, some of the biggest in the world, all the way down to little startups. Um, and started because my little brother actually challenged me to see who could get more TikTok followers in 2020 and ended up building a following wow. him out because the little brother has to lose you know that i mean you can't yeah. win right. um, yeah. he has about 2,000 followers um I definitely beat him so we're on we're on track but he was a part <laughs> of all my all my videos ended up cool. moving into like running brand collabs for a bunch of my friends that were influencers um cool. and running those collabs ended up running into the ubiquitous team because uh, i was helping run the cheeto super bowl commercial campaign cheeto so, or yeah. chia cheeto cheetos okay. the one that was like here's a real question Zach. now yeah the, the, the cheetos like what do you like you know the actual cheetos with the the mm -hmm. cheetah guy mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. here, here's a here's a real question and like i know we're here to talk about influencer marketing but this question is actually critical to see if okay. your knowledge is if anyone's knowledge here is credible we have to get figure this mm -hmm. out and we're gonna ask this in the chat too do you eat your cheetos with chopsticks no okay nope. Bree does Bree, you do you eat your cheetos with chopsticks Flaming hot Cheetos, I eat with a spoon. A spoon? I didn't know a spoon? This was Wait! Now, <laughs> and I've, been, I've literally been trying to keep this from everyone I love in my life for so long, and I didn't know LinkedIn Live was going to be the place that it would come out. But you can't have the hot Cheeto dust on your feet. It, it like ruins the whole experience. You need to have unfiltered Cheeto, just Cheeto to mouth. No interference with the dust on the fingers. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I have to leave now. I'm sorry if you have to leave now. I mean, we're gonna get into it, but like, 
Okay, wow. All right, I don't know if anyone else does it with the spoon or chopsticks. Let us know in the chat, but like, wow. Okay. Okay. Favorite ice cream, by the way. Uh, I like extreme moose tracks. So I don't know if you've had that. It's like the chocolate flavored ice cream with the peanut butter cups and chocolate. That's very you. That's very you. I feel hey. like that makes a lot of sense. You got to be there. Also, there's a bunch of a bunch of people in the chat. I love the cookie dough option. Peanut butter chocolate chip is incredible. Anyone fish who food says is vanilla? also elite. I like the fish food suggestion. Solid. Solid. Anyone who said vanilla, though, honestly, my dad says vanilla. And I don't know. It's like, mm, I don't know. It's too plain. Too plain for me. But anyways, we'll hop right into it. Um, I really want to first get your guys' take. I know influencer marketing is kind of like such a broad uh, mm -hmm. subject overall. There's so many different little pieces like creating the content. Honestly, influencers do that. We can talk about all that. But I want to hear hot take 2023. What is uh, your hottest take of influencer marketing this year? Um, if you have it, you can you can think about it for a second. I know that wasn't on our on our <laughs> I know what the heck. But, uh, <laughs> out with your question I'm, just, on the list. I'm just curious. I'm curious. I am. Taylor, Taylor, well, I'm sorry. I would say while we think about it, people want to fight you over vanilla, so you might might want to I, do, I do with the <laughs> I I'm gonna put my hot take as and we can discuss or just roll over, whatever we want to do. But my hot take yep. is uh TikTok will overtake most platforms in influencer spend this year, while creators will start moving to YouTube shorts because of the monetization aspect that starts in February. So that's my my hot take. That's not that hot. I'm just gonna come out and say that. <laughs> but hey, you'd be you would be surprised how many people think TikTok is gonna get banned still. So it. it's been yeah. quite an interesting. I think it's gonna just continue to grow and we'll we'll be here for years and years to come, regardless of what actually is happening and maybe some security updates happen, but I don't think I don't think uh, it's going anywhere anytime soon. Morgan I think yours? I, I think that, so if you look at the majority of B2B brands on YouTube, there's next to no video content there at all. Mm -hmm. I've actually gone through all of them, except for like Adobe is like really prominent. Slack is very prominent on there, but everyone mm -hmm. else is like, doesn't really have anything. I think this will be the time where as budgets will get, maybe get completely cut or they're going to be like, you know, downsized a little bit. People are going to try to figure out how do I get more organic content out there as they maybe don't want to spend money on paid ads because it's not as effective. And they switch over and they start doing long form SEO videos through YouTube and then getting influencers from LinkedIn to actually create videos as the byproduct through their channel. And then pumping out those videos through LinkedIn to continuously grow their YouTube channel to grow their SEO because LinkedIn doesn't have it. That's like my hot take because you go look at all the BB brands right now. Like they haven't posted like in three, four, five months. That's like my take. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So true. Mm -hmm. So true. The B two B video content on YouTube is so stale. The, the oh. stuff that is posted, it's really stale for the most part. Um, my hot take is: I think there's going to be a strong differentiation this year between creator and influencer. Those words are starting to mean different things internally for big brands. The price for a video creator for a paid ad is significantly cheaper than the price for an influencer with an existing follow followership to make that same video. And I think brands are noticing that. Um, like with paid ads where it's coming from the brand handles, I don't see why we're going to continue to pay influencer rates when I can pay a video creator to if we're crafting the message and the storyboard and the concept. Like I would rather pay a creator to do that than like a true influencer with following if it's coming from our brand handle. So I think that's kind of like my hot take is we're going to lean more towards these UGC creators, freelance creators uh, when our budget's tighter than go the traditional influencer route. I love that. It actually brings up a point also not on the list, but I was curious if you guys, I think there's a huge difference between creator and influencer. And I've been, yeah. I've been personally saying this for a long time. And there's some influencers who have no idea how to create. Maybe someone on their yes. team knows yes. how to create the video, knows how to put the yeah, stuff yeah, out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Find yeah. out who it is. Because if you have to work directly with this person who has no creativity, your work, you're doing all the work anyway. Um, and yeah. then there's like 
influ or creators who like maybe they don't have the following but man do they create good content and man yeah. do they create good stuff that the algorithm didn't pick them for whatever reason but yeah they're great so I've been I've been talking about this for a while and it, it's been it floats around but I'm, I'm glad the big brands are starting to notice Morgan in b2b side are you what do you consider yourself you you are an influencer and creator have you ever noticed the person who just has no idea what they're doing and they're like give me all my ideas give me a script or is that kind of how it is on that side uh so that is a that's a great point uh, like to think about creator versus influencer i think people think that once they create one piece of content now you are an influencer and there's a progression to get to that point of what an influencer is right and that impact so what i what i typically see is that they need in the B2B side, it's more so how do I get better at being a creative actually more than anything? Because most people that are in most people, right? Most people that are like B2B, let's say influencers, you consider them that they have the knowledge in their head because in order for you to really be out there in B2B, you have to have some type of like expertise in something, right? To be somewhat knowledgeable because it's not just pure entertainment like in the B2C side. It's like, okay, you have to have some type of subject matter. Mm -hmm. The obstacle though is, is in that, and most people probably see this on LinkedIn, where the content isn't like as maybe creative or explosive is because their creativity isn't there. So when I'm working with me people, I'm like, okay, this is great information, but how do we make this exciting so people don't just tune you out? That's why the webinars that we go to maybe aren't as a creative or explosive because they're like, they're smart, but it's like, okay, we got to make this a little bit more creative. So there is a little bit more of like back in, like what is the flow that we need to make this more intriguing for someone to engage or whatever that may be. So I, I interact and see that a lot. Yeah, that's interesting. You're like almost on the training side of teaching these people how to stop <laughs> being bad at what they do, like be better, you know, be better creation, helping them open their mind a little bit to see what people actually want. Um, and it also opens up another thing for me that I noticed was influencers i mean even if you have a big following it doesn't mean you necessarily influence your followers like with products so people are seeing like there's no mm -hmm. movement when i try and offer a product and it's like mm -hmm. well it's because nobody cares about that person they care about they make cool content like jumping off a building and i want to watch that but the, i don't even know who they are they wear a suit the whole time or whatever it happens to be engagement uh, right. doesn't always mean conversion correct Just because someone creates great content for their own audience that they've cultivated doesn't mean that that's going to lead to influence a buying decision for your brand. Yeah. So that's why I'm curious what you guys think. For me, it's really important when we go to work with an influencer that they have firm history of working with a lot of brands. There's some brands who I feel like like tapping those like unreached creators, people who don't have a lot of experience. I think if you're a smaller brand, you maybe have that flexibility, but for large brands like Adobe and Lyft, you're spending hundreds of thousand dollars on a campaign. I don't want to risk influencers that don't have history of conversion. Do you guys feel that same way? Do you think there's value in like tapping someone who doesn't have as much experience? I, I think the biggest thing is like, so I agree with you. Like the biggest thing is understanding what audience you're trying to get in front of, right? Because even if someone has like 200,000 followers, if out of those 200,000 followers, the audience that you're trying to get in front of is not relevant, there's no reason to be like, oh, they have a big, because that doesn't matter, right? Like, so you, what you have to look at is, okay, based on the audience that they have, what is the audience you're trying to get in front of? What are some things that they have done, right, so far with maybe some other brands or they've considered other brands to work with? And even in the space that, you know, I'm in from the B2B side, have they been using these products, right? Because some people may have already been using the products. Maybe they haven't worked with brands, but they've used the product. Okay, well, they're an advocate because they can use the contextual things that they've done to then share that as part of the product, at least on the B2B side. Yeah, I I totally agree, Bree. A lot of the small brands that we work with are very open to trying new things because their budgets just don't allow for them to use a sure, tried and true sure, proven sure, sure. influencer. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it does. Sometimes the influencers and a lot of them will work with a smaller brand's budget like you let them know and they're like okay you know i like the product i'll do it but a lot of times they're willing to try things and that's why a lot of times when we have to work with these smaller brand partners we have to try a lot of different things um at one time and then try to grab as many little data nuggets as possible and be like okay that person converted okay that person got a million views but we didn't sell anything we just had a product um called barsis that we were working with and it's like a coaster that mixes your drinks and 
we were getting millions of views, like millions and millions and millions of views and 10 purchases. We're like, what is happening? Like there's some messaging wrong. We changed the final line of their stuff to like, hey, check it out. You can make drinks links in my bio. They sold out their entire warehouse twice in a row after we were launching these type of things. So you can get the views, but it's a matter of like, hey, if you're getting the views, your content's right. If you got, But if you're not getting the sales, what's wrong? What's wrong with the pitch? Um, right. And it's a matter of fine tuning a little bit. So definitely, definitely feel you there, Bree. Um, what, what do you guys think has happened in the influencer space in the last 12 to 18 months? Like what is, what has changed? Um, where are we going to go? So I'd love to hear what has changed in the past 12 year, year and a half. And then where do you think we're going to take off from there? Um, from your guys' perspective. I can go first. Um, I think what I've seen less of is multi-platform campaigns, campaigns where you're tapping one influencer to post on reels, Instagram stories, in feed, TikTok, Twitter, Twitch, Reddit, whatever. I think mm -hmm. like we just ran an influencer campaign at Lyft, actually it's still going, but just TikTok focused, only, only TikTok. And that's because we really wanted to use creators who felt the most native to that platform. We didn't want an influencer who kind of had equal follower count across all platforms. We really wanted to zero in on like good quality video creators. So I think there's going to, that's been a huge change from uh, influencer campaigns I used to see earlier in my career that spanned across platform where you're trying to hit all their audiences on each channel. And now I think brands more comfy just putting all their eggs in TikTok or the Instagram basket. Cool. Morgan, what are you seeing in the okay. B2B space? What's changing up? What's happening? Um, so in the in the B2B space, a lot of it has been where a brand's like, hey, you're creating content. This is what we want you to do. You have no say. <laughs> that's like okay. that's like typically, typically how it sometimes will go, right? And so what happens is you see posts that don't have, and you know, you all can let me in the chat if you see this on LinkedIn, but you'll see posts or they're promoting something and you you don't feel the emotion from that creator. It's basically like, do here's the product, yeah. this, is what you should, this is what it is, like, check it out. And then like, you don't feel any emotional attachment to the actual person because you have been, but some, there's something a little bit off there. And you could tell that the brand gave them this thing to say. So what I think, what I've seen the change on and people I've been talking to, other people who are influencers as well on the platform and the B2B side is having a collaboration of the content. It's like, hey, here's my expertise. This is like where I creatively will attach to my audience. What needs to be said in here that's absolutely important? And now both of these teams could work together on how to put it out there. And I think marketers and the CMOs, VPs of marketing demand has started to see that like, okay, we need to let our creators have the say because we're going to have a better output in the long term than like, hey, this is what we need because we have to hit these metrics and like you need to say what we need to say. That doesn't help both parties. Yeah, we've actually been seeing that too. Agency side, like we have a, a couple partners and they would try to control so much. I mean, there's a point where we just have to, as the agency, be like, okay, we'll do it. And it, it happens and yeah. things just don't perform as well. And finally, with actually one of our partners, we're like, hey, we will run your campaign for you. It like flopped three months in a row. It was so strict, creative, exact scripted out for every creator. And then finally they agreed. So next month we'll find out we get to run our own full campaign with no say yep. from the brand or the brand gets say, but like they're letting us go. They're like, none of that's working for us. And we're like, sweet. We finally can let the creators actually create fun, engaging content. You're not going to see the same thing over and over again. They're going to be thrilled to make the content. It gets to the brands faster. The audience is going to like it better. It's just a, it's a win, 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 win. So you're probably going to get closer to that passion that you were talking about earlier. And I think to circle back, if, if you would allow me to, sure. to the UGC. <laughs> the world ain't moving forward. <laughs> <laughs> the UGC versus like true influence, traditional influencer model is that's where I think brands, that's when brands don't understand the difference between a content creator and an influencer who has their own platform, that's where you get into combos like that. Because if an influencer is making content for Lyft's own page, that's where we get into those nitty gritty edits because we take ownership of the content we're posting on the brand handle. Whereas the influencer might not be used to those rounds of edits because 
the influencer doesn't see it as just making content for a brand. They're also prioritizing how their audience usually responds to their content. So sometimes brands might be giving edits to an influencer as if they're a video creator. Yeah. And not remembering that this influencer has their own tone of voice style. And that's why it's important to have both of those things set up where you let the influencer do their thing on their own channels. But once you need content for your own channels, maybe hire a UGC video creator instead of an influencer. Cause that, that uh, type of creator is more used to those nitty gritty edits when you own the content. I don't know if any of that made sense, but 100%. yeah, yeah I think brands need to yeah. understand the difference. Did you have something yeah, to say on that Morgan? Yeah, I would say I think you, you have to be a guide. You have to be a guide and understand the contextual person of who you're working with. I think that's absolutely important. And one thing that you mentioned, I think the most important, either working with the influencer or the creative, is understanding what's the narrative of the campaign. I think that also is a big miss in working with people. You know, I was working brand right now and we're talking about like, hey, we run around this influencer campaign for the next, you know, three months in B2B, great. But I was like, what's the narrative, right? It's like, what are we actually trying to drive towards here, right? Because an influencer could take the narrative and be like, all right, cool. I saw a couple of people talking about scripts. That's the brief. The brief is, here's the narrative. An influencer could be like, cool, I understand that and go. A creative yeah. might need like, here's the narrative and like, here's the audience, here are yeah. the touch points, go, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. if you give someone like, hey, this is exactly what you need to say, and now it feels restrictive. Now I feel like, okay, you're telling me what to do. Like, I'm the creative here. But I absolutely agree with you. You have to understand who's the influencer, who's the creative, how much do we give them, how less do we give them, so they can feel empowered to do what they need to do. I love the yeah. idea of giving less to an influencer on purpose to let their like creative mind go. I really like that. I'm keeping Absolutely. that one in my back pocket. It's funny. We <laughs> integrate that exact thing in all of our briefs when we're sending it out to a creator. We come try to convince every brand to give, we call it creative freedom with guide rails. So you let them know where they can't go at all and let them figure out what they want, where the narrative goes, drive it themselves uh, for their audience. Super cool. But diving back into kind of, influencer marketing in general. Um, I'm pretty curious. So like diving into the tactics, influencers have become fairly platform specific. Some people platform agnostic. Um, I'm curious your guys' thoughts. Are you seeing and utilizing influencers? You said this, I think before Brie, that you're starting to run campaigns just on a single platform. When you run that campaign, and then you go say, start another Instagram campaign instead of a TikTok campaign. Are you looking back to those same influencers because they have what you like, or is it a completely different set of people on each different platform? I think historically it was the former, like in my experience at my old job, that was what we would have done is kind of look back at the same influencers and hit a new touch point from them. But I think now the future is really honing in on influencers that master that specific platform. Like, I think we all know like a Twitch influencer is so different just like by nature of the content you're putting on the platform than some, than that same person on Instagram, they're making different content. Um, oh yeah. So it's, yeah, I think, I think it's just going to be more of that. I, but to answer your question directly, historically we used to do that. And I think in the future, it's going to be even doubling down on platform specific stuff. Cool. Morgan, what do you think in, in that kind of space? I don't know. Are you typically when you're running a B2B campaign, since I'm not as familiar with that, is it typically just LinkedIn stuff? Or are you guys posting on other platforms as well? How does that work? Yeah. So you're typically looking at most of the time LinkedIn. There are unique scenarios where you might go to Twitter. You, you might try to do something on YouTube, but it's very rare. Most of it is going to be on LinkedIn and to Bree's point, and I think a lot of people probably agree this in the chat as well. Like most people you're interacting with, they're like prominent on like one platform and they've gone all in, which is like my advice for anybody who started creating, like don't go and be like, you know what? TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter. I think I'll add Pinterest in there and let me do it all at the same time. That is a recipe for disaster. Like I just, I do yeah. not recommend it. Like I went yeah. on LinkedIn, that's where my base is. And now I've started to be like, okay, let's check out some other channels because you built the foundation. So to my point, most of the time I see, yeah, we're going to do something on LinkedIn uh, newsletter. I've kind of had that in there as well, because that's really the big in the space from the B2B perspective, but you're really not branching out besides that. And when you are on LinkedIn though, 
that's where it gets a little bit unique because there could be like a video campaign, right? You could do a infographic campaign, right? There's different campaigns that you could run or even mm -hmm. like right now we're on a live show. You know, I know people who run LinkedIn events, right? So they're like, we have this show. We're going to run this for four months. We have X amount of guests. Here's our campaign we're going to run. We're going to bring different influencers on here to talk about the problem, use those clips, put them on LinkedIn. So there's different ways to go about it. But yeah, most of the campaigns I'm running or I'm talking to or I'm asked to do is on LinkedIn. Cool. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I think what we're seeing too is influencers will sometimes kind of like you said, Brie, hit a couple of different markets or like, hey, repost. Um, but definitely yeah. with the bigger brands, um, they're not they don't care as much about that. They're really focused on the the metrics that are coming in from that one platform. And it's it's kind of like, hey, do this. Smaller brands are still open to going and diversifying across different things. And I think they kind of have to be willing to because they don't have as much budget to test everything. But if they can get a couple influencers to repost on different platforms, it helps a lot. Um, but I think we're I think we're going to see exactly what you guys are talking about. Pretty focused creators. Creators are going to stick to one and be get really good at it. And that's where hopefully we see even bigger, you know, influencers and conversions coming from that as well. Um, and one more point on this before yeah. I move on, um, and I think Taylor in the chat is kind of alluding to this specialized, not only are we like specializing or um, picking focused influencers per platform through our influencer campaigns, but also on the brand social side, we are having pretty different voice, tones, goals, strategies per platform as well. So like you look at, you know, Queen Zaria on Duolingo their TikTok and look at their Twitter side by side, it's a different person running the account, it feels like, although I know it's all her and her team. And so it wouldn't make sense to have one campaign on Twitter and TikTok, knowing that their TikTok persona and how people are used to seeing Duolingo on TikTok is so different than Twitter, that you really need mm -hmm. to be focused on each platform. So I think like the influencer campaigns are kind of mirroring what's happening on the brand social side, where we're having different strategies that feel very different uh, on each platform. I love that. That's exactly what I've been thinking. And it's really interesting to, to hear you say that though, as, as the big brand side, it's like, yeah, you, you almost have to have a full different voice of influencers on each different platform that you're utilizing. And it's really different. Um, Cammie just asked us, is there specific influencer content that you recommend um, for Instagram over TikTok or vice versa? Is there like a different way to create short form content that you're seeing? Uh, Brie or Morgan? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. I feel like it's changing month by month. Um, <laughs> day by day. <laughs> it's changed since we started this live. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, gen oh, sorry, Brie. I would say general general point, they're fairly similar. I, I almost, I categorize a lot of times on calls, short form video content. It has a lot of, similar things across the platforms and so if you're going to create short form got to be short engaging fun and where the difference comes in is i mean instagram is a couple months behind tiktok still on on reels and everything so um, if you want to look at tiktok from a couple months ago you'll probably be really popular on instagram and i think it's a little bit more polished unless you're seeing an instagram uh unless you're seeing a TikTok logo at the bottom that they reposted, oh, seems God. to be a little more polished overall. <gasps> so, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a L right So there. many influencers <laughs> be sending us videos with TikTok watermarks, for reals. <laughs> and I want to rip my hair out. Um, I feel like where we say, have seen success so far um, between Instagram and TikTok is Instagram is a lot more straightforward, punchy type of content and type of like audios and skits and captions and TikTok, you can be a little more sarcastic, nuanced. The audience almost seems a little smarter on TikTok, not in the traditional sense, but you don't have to spoon feed them the joke or the punchline. <laughs> okay. And on Instagram, you're like, this is funny because X, Y, Z. And I don't know if that has to do with age or like the on Instagram, you're hitting a super broad audience and on TikTok, they're algorithm and their like ad specialties let you focus a little bit more but mm -hmm. that's what we've learned on the brand side so far yeah i feel like instagram is a little bit more polished and then tiktok's like yo rogue let's see what happens rogue. that that's 
That's what that's what it that's what my visual that's what I that's what I see it as. I think like the the one liner for if you're just joining as a TikTok like social media manager, it's like uh, ask for forgiveness rather than permission. You know that the the classic yeah. line because you just gotta go, <laughs> yeah. gotta do it, gotta see what happens <laughs> and figure it out. I'm curious, Morgan, have you seen a rise in short form video posted on LinkedIn overall, or is it still very text based and picture occasionally oriented? Yeah, so a couple, so a couple things that I've seen there. So there have been people who are in the B two B world and they've gone to TikTok, and they have taken some of their TikToks or short form and put them on LinkedIn. Now, according to a lot of algorithm studies and, and people who really study this, videos native have gone down in reach over time, and that's that's at least what they have said, and that's what the algorithm says, and I've seen that as well because I do a lot of video content. So I think at some point it'll start to level up. However, LinkedIn does have a program that most people don't know about. It's called the Nano Tip program. So they've actually been saying, hey, if you're a creator and you're short form and you're B2B, like send us your short form video. So they're trying to ramp that up behind the scenes, which that to me, yeah, to me, that means that they're probably going to start inserting some type of feed with nano tips will then allow people to get more reach on those videos as they try to figure out to get to short form. Cause I don't see LinkedIn just like neglecting completely that short form is like where a lot of people want to consume content, but I don't see, I don't see a lot of it, but I do see people doing it. And I think over time we will start seeing more. If we got any teaser with the LinkedIn stories, we know that Oh, the video <laughs> UI on LinkedIn has a lot to, to grow. <laughs> Until, oh, until yes. we get a successful feed of video content. Wow. Um, next question for you guys. I'm curious, what would be the differences or what, what do you guys see as the differences between a B2B influencer strategy versus a B2C influencer strategy? Um, and I think it's probably open just to talk about it because maybe we don't necessarily know each other's strategies, but I'm totally open. I really want to know kind of what are the differences and what, what I guess we can start with, what are the goals uh, at Lyft? Like what is a goal for your campaign, Bree? And then we can go to like, what's one of your clients, Morgan? Like what are, what are yeah. the goals there and how do they differ? So I've never done B to uh, B for influencers. So I'm definitely leaning on Morgan for that answer. Uh, at Adobe is <laughs> only focused on B to C as well although our B2B team killed it. Um, I think from the outsider looking in, the main differences are awareness versus conversion and like what point of the funnel we're at uh, with influencer campaigns. And you know this, Zach, like typically the goals for Lyft are awareness and engagement. Um, engagement as a proof point that the content does really well. But at the end of the day, we kind of acknowledge that there's not a clear track to follow someone seeing a general video about Lyft's brand and ordering a ride, we don't have that uh, path of purchase possible because of uh, like TikTok limitations and everything that comes along with social. So we're always like leaning super heavily on awareness. And I feel like, uh, again, curious to hear your thoughts, Morgan, but I would assume that on B2B, it tends to be a little easier because you're linking out to a resource, to a landing page, um, to firm next steps. And then also just the nature of B2B being able to have salespeople ask where that interest came from. You can try to link more, more, um, more success to influencer stuff. Whereas we don't really have that benefit on B2C. Interesting. Okay. okay. Um, I'm, I'm like, I'm like laughing at the comments, LinkedIn stories, Instagram notes, Twitter fleets, like what? <laughs> yeah. They might have like, yo, LinkedIn, LinkedIn stories was, yeah, that was a, it was a fever uh, dream. It was a, <laughs> I don't even know what to say. Like, in my life. Like, what the fact that LinkedIn happening? stories and um, what Clubhouse <laughs> existed at the same time. Yeah. A lot to unpack there for a future. A lot. A lot to unpack. There's a 30 for 30 on that alone. <laughs> LinkedIn stories and Clubhouse. <laughs> 30 for 30 is what we need. Um, but Bree, so the way the way that I work with client, I'll kind of give like overall client work right now. We look at things in tangibles and intangibles. So mm -hmm. tangibles like, okay, what's percentage of the close revenue? What are referrals, et cetera. Now in B2B, you just are going to have a longer sales cycle, right? Some of these sales cycles could be three, four, five, six months, right? We're not going to have one campaign and we're going to convert. Some of them are 30 to 45 days and it's possible. So 
in the campaign that I'm working on right now, what we're really focused on is number one, how many referrals are we getting out of this campaign, right? We got X amount of conf- referrals maybe last year. What are the referrals that we're going to get throughout the next, you know, five, six months, whatever it may be, maybe. The intangibles are things that you mentioned, like what are the impressions? What is the social lift that we had? How many engagement pieces did we have? And the way that we think about it in B2B is we're like, yeah, we're going to put content out there, but we're actually going to go hop on other things. So we're going to go into other communities. We're going to get on podcasts, right? We're going to get on different avenues in that realm to get our message out there too. So I don't know if B2C campaigns, it's like, we're going to create content and get on podcasts. But what I've been telling people is, yeah, we could post on LinkedIn, but some of the people who have good experience and good knowledge may not have a brand, right? So in order to like elevate people, we might have to actually tell, say, hey, go on this podcast. We'll get clips from the podcast. Mm-hmm. We'll, give, we'll give you clips from there. We'll push you out in that way, right? So in B2B, it's a little bit different. I'm actually looking at who already has audiences. Okay, great. Let's just go there to share the story. Very similar how, you know, you see when people are releasing a book. I think Matthew McConaughey was releasing his book. He was on like 80,000 podcasts, right? He was on he was on every podcast possible. So like the same thing in B2B. It's like, okay, there's a lot of podcasts. There's a lot of companies who have podcasts. Let's get them on there and, and start sharing the message so we can get clips from the podcast and use that at volume. So quasi-talent managing them, it sounds like. You're adding a yeah. lot of value for their portfolio beyond just posting on their own social platforms. You're introducing them to other platforms so they kind of build in that credibility that you need. Yeah, because a lot of the B2, a lot of people in the BB side, because of the subject matter expertise they have, they also want to get their brand increased. They also want to make sure that they can get speaking engagements, et cetera. So we're like, okay, on behalf of our campaign, yeah, we want you to talk about whatever we're going to talk to you about. But what do we also want you to do? Oh, yeah, we also want to elevate you and empower you as well. So it's a win-win on that side. And and we know that in the B2B influencer realm, your chances of getting the public talks are there because you're working with these brands, you're putting out different content, et cetera. Mm, That's super interesting. I have a quick question about B2B influencers. Are they, is there a lot of full-time B2B influencers where they don't have another job or not doing things? Or is it, how does it look? This is a this is a great question. So um, I'm curious what the what the chat thinks on this as well. So there's not there's not a whole lot. There's not a whole lot. Like I myself right now, like yeah, like I don't I do my thing. I'm on my own, so I'm able to do that. But I've been posting for since 2016, right? So I think it takes a lot of the time to build that credibility to be like I'm gonna also do my own thing. A lot of the influencers that you probably see or follow on LinkedIn have a job right now or maybe are an executive and they're sharing their expertise through their story of what they're at now to give you content to the point where like, okay, I've learned everything I need to learn. Now I can go off my own and I can take ownership in it. So I've seen less B2B influencers being full-time because I think a lot of people are still trying to figure out what the heck is B2B influencer marketing, right? Because B2C is already way, way, way ahead. So a lot of people are still trying to figure out what does this even mean? Uh, which is why yeah. I'm, I'm on the on the cusp of figuring out what does that mean too with with the clients I work with, but yeah, there's not a lot of people who are full time. This is what they do. I think a lot of people want that, um, but it's not a whole lot. Yeah, wow, that that's so interesting, to me. It seems like it's going to be a pretty developing area of influencer marketing coming through is finding those experts. I think the stars will shine, kind of like uh, is it Zarya from Duolingo that's doing that. She, if she decided to go off on her own, I feel like she's the expert now. People know that and she could go consult and do whatever she wants just because she's had that big of a spotlight. But you're right. It almost Mm -hmm. does take like a a business stage. You need to be there, have the story, get the experience because it is all business. It's not like I can just go create fun videos or go experience life. I have to experience (laughs) business. Um, I have to experience business. business. Yeah, (laughs) you have to, you know? Yeah, you Uh, have to know the audience. That, that's really interesting. It kind of makes me laugh. You guys, I'll have to, I never haven't sent it to you guys yet, but at our, at Ubiquitous, we just started our own TikTok channel called Becoming Ubiquitous, where we're basically filming a reality show of what happens with our company and like the weird relationships we have and random stuff just through TikTok. So it made me think like that's the reverse of what these people like 
people are actually living a business life to then go post on LinkedIn. So they get content rather than like go to the Maldives. It's like, oh, I go to the office to get my content. <laughs> <laughs> so was this LinkedIn Live just a really long winded uh, play for a shameless plug for the ubiquitous TikTok? I mean, were you waiting was... to drop that in this entire yeah, time? He was, he's been waiting. <sighs> I actually wasn't even going to drop it in. I just think it's hilarious. And I laugh at myself every time, like half the videos <laughs> are them making fun of me. And so I just... Oh, now I'm really like, following. You got to look at <laughs> one, one of the intro videos, they just make fun of my laugh because I like laugh really loud and it's funny. So yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good time. It's a go. good time for sure. Um, to get a little bit back on track, um, what do you guys think? How do you integrate a influencer campaign into an overall broader strategy for a brand? Like, hey, we're trying to go for this mission. Let's include influencers in it um do you see that happen in your industry and then how do you do it if you do see it mm, and we say overall hard. mission saying like it comes from like the ceo i'm saying like hey we want to start selling more mailboxes or something and we're like this is they have a full ad campaign going they have whatever going how do you see or morgan is probably a lot of times they'll come to you with that brief and that's how they're integrating but what is the best way for them to like you mentioned getting on podcasts, getting these clips to run ads, maybe behind, do different things. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing? Are people integrating influencers into a broader campaign or is it like, hey, I have a just strictly influencer strategy. Mm -hmm. We're going to stick only to that. It's not really going to affect other things going on. So there's like there's like two examples. Um, one is when an organization is looking to get interest back into their brand because they have a product update or a rebrand. So they'll tap influencers where it is. I think sales off did this. They were looking to change their branding. So they have like uh, what what's in the box campaign is what they did. And so it was like, what's what, what it is it? And then it ended up being like the new branding colors and things of that nature. So that's an example of they tagged a couple influencers. They had them do a video. Hey, like what's the new rebrand? And then it was like, here's the rebrand. They had a whole video around it. So that's that's like one example. Second is any type of like event. So there are a lot of companies who have like these events in B2B. Most notable is like a Dreamforce, for example, Saster, et cetera. So they'll tap influencers to promote that event. Maybe they're speakers, maybe they're just advocates, and they'll get people to drive attendance to that event through the influencers that they have. So that's like another example as well. So those are ones that I've seen to be the most Prominent, I think we'll start seeing more examples as people get into this more, but those are two I've seen pretty consistently. Cool. And on the B2C side, I think historically influencer has been like one section of a really big integrated campaign. Like at Adobe, for example, we had the partnership with Amazon Video when we did the Lord of the Rings launch with them. So we had like website we had out of home we had in product we had home screens and push notifications organic social paid social and influencers was like one prong of a huge campaign where we saw huge problems with that is we were always fighting to educate the broader campaign team on what influencers were so they were always like oh yeah we can get some influencers to talk about it and use this dumbass uh instagram filter and like blah blah <laughs> Let's just throw like an AI filter and like, uh, let's just like do that. And that's what happens when you have a campaign team who's not really close to social and has a really big budget. And so I think what has been refreshing at my time at Lyft is uh, our marketing org really understands the unique value of influencers and also understands to like be more hands off. Give us, give us the goals that you're trying to reach and tell us like you were mentioning, like the narrative that we're trying to say but let us do the thing with the influencers. Don't try to force campaign slogans on top of influencer stuff that we're doing over here. So I think more brands are moving towards that direction where influencers is still a part of a larger integrated campaign, but hopefully organic social teams can have more control over what those campaigns look like. Nice. Yeah, I love that. I think it's been, it's interesting here. We have not seen at agency side, we haven't seen too many brands trying to integrate other strategies it's a lot of times when a smaller brand they'll come to us and be like 
all right, we're putting our, all of our dollars on influencer marketing. We've seen it's big. And we're like, hey, you got to make sure your funnel is ready to handle this. You got to make sure there's no leaky, leaky spots in it. We even had a couple brands come to us and we launched the campaign run super well. But, mm. you know, smaller brands, you don't know, is your price wrong? Like, is the client like just falling through there? Is is the funnel like not sending all the notifications correctly to them? Are they getting actually integrated in that email funnel? So it's been sometimes like consulting with these smaller brands to help teach them how to build out that full funnel um, to make sure that they can continue growing overall. Um, yeah. I see a question from Chantal. Uh, how do you compare influencers versus ambassadors? And is the marketing strategy similar or two totally different things? Ooh. Ambassadors, yeah, ambassadors from my take are limited to a very specific type of brand. Um, not all brands can have an ambassador program just by the nature of the product or the service or the company. Um, and I, I don't know if this is like a super spicy take. I don't see a strong value in having both ambassador and influencer programs. If anything, it would be influencer and UGC creator, not influencer and ambassador. I don't know if that uh, if you guys agree with that or not, but interesting. Morgan, yeah. your take? Yeah. So in our space, it's interesting, and I laugh because I tell people that this, I there's a drastic difference. So in, in our B two B space, and some of you may have seen this from certain brands in our space in the tech space, is that people will have like strategic advisors, and then they'll have oh, like yeah, yeah. brand ambassadors, which are t- two different things across the board, right? Strategic advisors, like okay, like I'm coming in and I have legitimate said it earlier business experience to tell you how to actually do this product run this co- or help me with the company etc brand ambassador is like okay they're probably a good creator and they can help elevate your brand awareness but they're probably not coming in to do any strategic advisory so a uh, question is a little bit different on my end is that i see a lot of people like saying oh this is our strategic advisor but really they're brand ambassadors and you have to distinguish that you have a brand ambassador great they create they push out content they're there that's helpful but that's different than a strategic advisor and even in our space like there are people who are i guess influencers but they're only a part of like the campaign i would tell people to get i'm with brie here i would tell people to get influencers from a b2b standpoint and only have strategic advisors i would actually say don't even really get brand ambassadors on the b2b side because it just causes confusion yeah I totally agree with that. On our side, typically ambassador, what we we hear is just like you said, Brie, it's just the uh, ambassador programs. It's typically like a uh, product for post type thing where yeah. a bunch of very small influencers. Yeah. But it's weird. For some reason in my head, I think of an ambassador as honestly, it's like that. But then I also think of a brand ambassador as someone who's constantly posting about a brand or that they use the brand without ever being asked to by the brand it's like they're they're an ambassador almost and they become an influencer once they get paid but it's like brie if you were watching tiktoks or something all of a sudden you just see the same person hyping up lyft talking about how dope lyft is it's incredible yeah. and it, it's just natural to their content i almost consider that yep. a brand ambassador they're moving the message forward but the second we pay them they become like an influencer or that we Got know that's their influence yep. yeah yeah um, I see both ways. I feel like with ambassadors, that kind of like isn't a proof point of what happens when you give people too little control who don't have that experience. Like earlier, we talked about how it's important to let influencers do their own thing because they have that experience and know what their audience likes. But typically with brand ambassadors as smaller creators, you you have to give them less control because you're not paying them like with a formal brief, but also you run into more. I feel like with my experience, I, I worked on the ambassador team at Fabletics, which has like arguably the largest ambassador team ever. Like I think we had 800 influencers, like micro creators, nano creators. And it got really tough to like keep a quality of content going and making sure people were hitting the messages we asked them to, but also we weren't paying them. So anyway, it's a, it's, it's a lot of coordination. It's a hard balance. Interesting. So it's possible to use that and it's a lot of work, but it costs less money is what I'm hearing. Oh um, yeah. It costs less money. <laughs> uh, I'm curious. I see in the chat, people are talking about how ambassadors and affiliates get mixed together. Totally curious on one. If you guys think of anything different for me, ambassador and affiliate is very similar term would love in the chat for you guys to write that. But, 
curious for you, Morgan, your takes on ambassador versus affiliate. Oh, yeah. I think different brands define that different ways. Um, I think it's a small nuance, at least from from my perspective. I think Same it's here. I think both are product for post and not payment for post. Okay. Yeah. I I, I don't have a change in that. I agree with that answer. Okay. Cool. Well, we're we're down to the last five minutes, it looks like. And I'm curious, what is one I want to hear biggest highlight of the year, just because that's a lot of fun and I want to hear what you're most excited about this year. Um, but then also what is your number one takeaway for your audience, for the audience here to take from this in influencer marketing, going on their way in 2023, doing whatever they do, B2C, creator, a, uh, B2B agency? Biggest takeaway professionally, personally? I mean, biggest highlight professionally and personally? Sure. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, my personal highlight was getting my cat. I'm a mother, a mother of one, my Woo! cat. Okay. Um, and <laughs> my professional highlight, well, I started this job uh, in 2022. So I, I took a big leap um, for my career and for my own growth to get the autonomy I wanted. And I did it and I'm happy I did. So that was like a huge professional highlight for me. Nice. That's awesome. I, I can give my my uh, takeaways after Morgan goes. Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll end with um, takeaways. Let's end with takeaways. Personal. Let's think of pers personal. Um, I'm starting kickboxing. I guess we can go into that. Starting kickboxing. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. 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 I was like, I'm I'm really big into UFC. My dad and I watch all the time. We've actually been to two UFC events. So we're like massive. And I was like, you know what? Like, let me try it out. Am I going to compete? No. We're not going to take it to that level. But at least want to train and then see how I feel about it. And then if I like okay. really feel it. Then like now you're telling me I need to go compete. Now now you're like, well, you gotta person. you gotta compete with like the influencer ones when they come up, and you could be like, shoot your name into the ring, be like, hey, these are all TikTokers. I'm gonna bring the business people with the money. I'll fight them <laughs> and be a B influence right there. That's so they get the sponsorship. It could be my thing. Name. <laughs> it could be my thing. That would be wild. Be my thing. But uh, we'll see. We'll see as I we'll see as I get into it. Uh, and then highlight for me has been. A couple months ago, went off on my own. So that's been like the biggest highlight for me. And it's been like definitely a freeing, also, you know, roller coaster journey, but especially in a freeing journey. And with that, going back into my YouTube, I did YouTube like in like 2016, really enjoyed it, had fun. And now I'm going back into it deeper. So that's a highlight for me is just starting that again. Nice. Cool. Uh, personal highlight for me, I guess. Uh, I moved to Tennessee, bought a house. So this has been, it's been a good, Good year. Where are you, so Chattanooga, far. Knoxville. Where are you at? Chattanooga. How'd you know? Chattanooga. No, where are nice. you at? Was, I'm in I'm in Atlanta, so it's not far at all. Oh. And yeah, I'm moving to Nashville that. in a month. We're all gonna hang out in person. We'll yeah. do it live <laughs> next time. There we go. <laughs> uh, and then business, I think it's just been exciting growing a company, like being here with you know, starting with three or four employees and now we're at over fifty five and just kind of growing it and Last year, we were excited for a month when we booked a campaign for like 20,000. And now we're shooting for goals of well over six, seven figures every month or else we're, we're not happy. So it's funny, like the thrill and, and happiness, it all changes just based on growth overall. And so we're, we're really excited to kind of hit this new year running. Um, all right, Bree, we're coming around. What Takeaways. is the, your um, biggest takeaway? If you could only say one thing, to someone who is starting their influencer marketing this year? Uh, this year is, I think, understanding the difference between an influencer and a creator is like highest priority. Make sure your execs understand it. Make sure you understand it. And not every campaign needs to have an influencer. And sometimes creators can fill that gap. Uh, so definitely feel feel confident in, the dif in knowing the difference between those two this year. Morgan, you mentioned, you mentioned this earlier in the chat. I think it was important to double click on this is that when you do run your campaign, whether what, or doesn't matter what platform you're on to make sure you have someone on the team or someone that can be a consultant or whatever that is to understand the narrative and the story of that platform at the current moment so that you can optimize the most out of that channel. Yeah. Love that. Also Perfect. love double click. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, we got to double click. <laughs> and final thought, because I know we all have to go and have to hop. Um, I would say be ready to be agile. Um, you're going to learn a lot from your campaign. So even if it even if it doesn't get you all the results you want, you learn something from it and take what you learn to move on to your next campaign. Don't just throw influencer marketing away because it didn't get you exactly what you wanted on the first time. Um, but that. that's all. That's all we got here, guys. Um, excited to kind of chat with you guys further, but I hope you all have a great day. And let us know if you liked it in the comments and we'll, we'll continue the conversation another time. But thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you Good all. to see you Another guys. One. Cheers. Bye.